Hello, this is Dr. Patrick Russell, and in this videotape lecture, we'll discuss the prologue and chapter one of Dei Verbum, one of the four constitutions of Vatican II. Now, if you have not yet read the first ten paragraphs in Dei Verbum, or haven't reviewed chapter two, specifically pages 26 to 32, in Hannenberg's Concise Guide to the Documents of Vatican II, please stop the video and, and do those two things. We'll be going through the document in uh, some detail, and it'll be helpful and important that you've actually read the document, particularly the paragraphs we'll be discussing. And likewise, a review of Hannenberg's book will give you a context in which this document emerged. Assuming you've done those two things, let's move now to the fundamental question of this document. And of course, it's about revelation, but it's not so much about what is revelation, but rather, how does God reveal himself to us? Or if we were to use maybe more common language, we might say, how do we get to know who God really is? And I might even push that a step farther by saying it more colloquially, how does God bear his soul or show us the real you to us? Maybe I can use an analogy. Uh, you all know me, but you don't really know me. You might know my curriculum vitae. You know that I'm a professor of scripture. You know that I've served as the vice president for intellectual formation an academic dean. Uh, you might know that I must have some commitment to the church given my profession. You might know that I'm married. You might know some other facts about my children. Uh, but you don't really know me, do you? Uh, and to be quite fair, I don't really know you at some deep level. Uh, I know parts of you, and I might be able to intimate some understanding of you based upon those facts. But unless you really knew my story, my history, my motivations, my unfolding understanding of who I am and what my purpose in life is, uh, would you say you really know who I am? And there are people that really know me because they know those parts of my story. Colloquial terms, we talk about that as bearing our soul, right? We talk about how I bear my soul to certain people or I show the real me to others. Well, the same thing we can say about God. And that's why I say what's being discussed in this document, Dei Verbum, it's about how does God bear his soul or show the real him to us, the real you, if you will, in the thou-I relationship. And this was important in the discussions of Vatican II, as Hannenberg makes a point. He says that the first draft of the uh, document was rejected by the majority of the uh, bishops at the uh, at the Vatican II Council. And the problem was, I would say, is that it was too much about God's resume. It was a propositional nature about God rather than a more fundamental discussion of revelation. And I think that's what the church fathers picked up when they said that it wasn't pastoral enough, uh, that it needed to be more open, that it needed to reflect greater span of the nature of who God was and how, how we came to know who God was uh, in a more dynamic manner. And the result was that Vatican II articulated Revelation in much more personal, dynamic, and interrelational terms than uh, what was originally proposed. And this is one of the uh, developments unfolding in Vatican II. So, how did Vatican II understand Revelation? Well, the first clue is the document's title, The Word of God. The Word of God. Now, that can pass by us very quickly because that's what Dei Verbal means, the Word of God. But notice the focus upon the Word. The focus is upon communication. And again, I, get, I think this gets at the heart of what I just was talking about. In that, the primary way we get to know each other is through verbal communication, through our discussions, through our sharing of our stories, uh, through our revelation of our thoughts, through our words, also through our actions because our actions sometimes speak louder than our words. But that both cases, we're communicating, we're expressing uh, who we are. So this is a key because I think uh, the title itself indicates that the primary way we get to know who God is, uh, is through that kind of dialogue manner that God has engaged us over the many, many centuries. So let's move to the document itself. Let's begin with the first paragraph, and maybe just as important as the title is the prologue because it sets the tone and sets out the agenda of the entire document. So let's read this quickly. 
uh, hearing the word of God with reverence and proclaiming it with faith, the sacred synod takes its direction from these words from St. John. So they selected out of all of scripture one passage. So this must be important, right? It's important that we look at this passage to see what the council is trying to communicate about the nature of how God reveals himself to us. From the first letter of John, chapter 1, the second to third verses. We announce to you the eternal life which dwelt with the Father and was made visible to us. What we have seen and heard, we announce to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our common fellowship be with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. First, notice that this opening passage establishes the Catholic view that it's both scripture and tradition that are sources of revelation into one common deposit of faith. Uh, not separate, but intermingled and connected, but distinct. Because notice here that in this passage it talks about what we've seen and heard. And uh, this will be an important distinction because seeing is seeing the actions of God in the world. While hearing, of course, is a verbal reception of that word. From this initial quote from the first letter of John, we see key themes that will emerge within the body of Dei Verbum about the nature of Revelation. The first one I want to talk about is the focus upon preaching that frames the entire doc. This idea of announcing, if we think about announcing, we tend to think of something that's oral. It can be done in a written form, of course, but primarily begins with an oral communication. We'll see this evolving in the text this focus upon preaching as fundamentally the way that God reveals himself and it is through oral communication that God first reveals himself and we call this the priority of oral tradition. And then it goes on and says, to you the eternal life, and this is very important. The text will discuss how uh, what God reveals is essential to salvation. That's what's revealed. We'll go farther into this, but this gets into this whole discussion about uh, does God reveal about uh, mundane matters or not, like uh, history or mathematics or things like that? And the point is, what God talks about in terms of himself is about what's necessary for salvation. That's what we fundamentally know about God. And then it goes on, which dwelt with you in the faith and was made visible to us. So notice that these are things that have come through the faith and they're somehow made visible. And this is really interesting because it goes on and says, what we have seen and heard, we announce to you. But most biblical scholars would claim that the writer of the first letter of John is not an original disciple of Jesus. That his testimony is based upon the witness and words of the apostles. And so therefore, what he's announcing is what has been brought to him through oral tradition. And he claims that through that, through the testimony and witness of the apostles that he can proclaim what he's seen and heard. Just notice, if I've seen things, I've seen deeds. And deeds relate more towards actions. And I'd say there's a sort of a connection here between, with tradition. You know, we think about how God reveals himself through the actions of the church, not just through the words of the church. And same thing in the second word, heard. That, of course, is more oral. And there we think about uh, this idea that God reveals himself through uh, oral communication. So that we have here the Word of God is being articulated in terms of both the actions of God and the words of God. And uh, that's the Word of God, combination of those two. And it's somehow in the encounter or the experience of the words and deeds of God that we come to this fellowship. And that's very important because this document is going to stress the relational, personal connection to God. Uh, as how revelation works. Revelation is not, as I talked about earlier, propositional, intellectual only sort of engagement with God, but is at a deeper level, some sort of deeper encounter with uh, the divine, that it has this relational nature to it. And then finally, obviously there's a parallel between the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, but this is a very Christocentric text, um, as we'll see as we follow the rest of the document. So those are sort of some key things. This initial passage uh, frames and opens up. Therefore, following the footsteps of the Council of Trent and of the First Vatican Council, this present council wishes to set forth authentic doctrine on divine revelation and how it is to be handed on so that by hearing the message of salvation, 
the whole world may believe, by believing it may hope, and by hoping it may love. And I want to re-emphasize this idea of salvation, because this is the key element within the text. And then finally, this last part talks about belief, hope, and love. It has echoes to 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul also talks about faith, hope, and love. But remember, in that passage, the greatest of these is love. So I think that's not accidental, obviously, that the Council Fathers decided to use this language. What do we know about what God loves? What uh, rouses him? What breaks his heart? How does he spend his time with us? This will tell us everything if we can discover what God loves. And that, in fact, Revelation is the way we find that out. So now if we move on to paragraph two, now we're actually in the first chapter. And this is trying to get at the nature of Revelation. Revelation specifically is framed as an encounter, uh, not as content, but as an encounter. And this second paragraph says, In his goodness and wisdom, God chose to reveal himself and to make known to us the hidden purpose of his will. So notice that Revelation is God's self-communication. This is the point. We only know what we really know through his decision to reveal himself. Otherwise, we can know things about God, but we can't get to that essence of God without his self-communication, which is true about you and me. Unless I choose to share who I am, you won't know truly who I am. I won't really reveal myself to you. And it goes on and says, By which through Christ, the Word made flesh, man might in the Holy Spirit have access to the Father and come to share in the divine nature. Which uh, many uh, scholars have pointed out that this language of sharing in his divine nature is very Greek, or at least it has more of an emphasis within the uh, Eastern tradition and early Christianity, this idea of divinization. That that's, in some sense, we come to share in that divine nature, we become divinized, is the language from the early church fathers. And it's through this revelation, therefore, that the invisible God, out of the abundance of his love, speaks to men as friends and lives among them, so that he may invite and take them into fellowship with him. These three concepts of friends living among us, fellowship, again point out the revelation is primarily personal, not doctrinal or dogmatic, that it's this encounter element that uh, we can see the invisible God through the visible Christ. And it goes on and states, This plan of revelation is realized by deeds and words, having an inner unity. So again, we have this focus upon deeds and words, which will parallel uh, scripture and tradition, it will parallel proclamation and sacraments. The deeds wrought by God in the history of salvation manifest and confirm the teachings and realities signified by the words while the words proclaim the deeds and clarify the mystery contained in them. So you see this interrelationship between deeds and words that the document wants to establish very crucial when it starts to discuss tradition and scripture. Because it was, uh, uh, yes, they're separate, but they're also ultimately one deposit of faith. Hannenberg points out this was a key question within the deliberations of Vatican II. Uh, do we see a priority of tradition over scripture or vice versa? And the answer could be no, they're, they're so intermingled and yet distinct. Um, and of course, this idea of deeds and words relates to not just scripture and tradition, but also proclamation and sacrament, the two parts of the liturgy. So we talk about how we have the liturgy of the word, the liturgy of the Eucharist, yet it, it is one liturgy. And then it goes on. By this revelation, then, the deepest truth about God that is, his innermost self. And salvation of man shines out, again, notice the salvation element, for our sake in Christ, who is both the mediator and the fullness of all revelation. So again, as we stress, this is a very Christocentric text because that's how we truly know essence of God is through Christ. And what we know about God's salvific desires for us comes through Christ. Now let's move on to paragraph three. From this point forward, uh, we won't work through every text in as much detail as we did with the first two paragraphs. Rather, I'll summarize key elements in each paragraph. So, in paragraph three, the Council Fathers want to do here is make sure we understand that God communicates himself beyond simply scripture and tradition. He also communicates himself through creation and history. And later on, in paragraph six, they also discuss reason. Now, why is this the case? Well, because since God creates all things and keeps them in existence, Creation itself witnesses and communicates God. This, of course, is the basis for natural law theory within Catholicism. Also, why then through history? Well, because of God's manifestation to the patriarchs and prophets, history also 
reveal God's salvific plan. So the ways in which God, as the master of history, can be known through that historical march. And then finally, paragraph 6 says that God, quote, can be known with certainty from created realities by the light of human reason. And this, again, is uh, an element within Catholic thought, that reason helps us understand who God is. Therefore, there's uh, that capacity of the intellect to come to know the nature of God. Now, that said, the next paragraph wants to say, well, what's then why you need Christianity? <laughs> you need Christianity because of Christ. And there's a unique element to the Christ Christian witness that without it, you're really not able to come to the fullness of revelation. You know, again, going back to my analogy of you knowing me, uh, you can know about me. You might even have some uh, hints about who the nature of my personality is. But without sort of a fuller engagement with me, you don't really know me. I haven't borne my soul to you. The point in paragraph four is that we're able to truly know the essence of God through Christ. That's the fullest way God reveals his nature. Paragraph four says that it's through Christ that, uh, that God reveals his innermost being. That's really a powerful statement. I mean, that's the bearing your soul thing that I've been talking about, that it's in Christ that God bears his soul. His language here in uh, Vatican II is it reveals his innermost being. It's also through Christ that the work of salvation is completed. So that's why Christ is essential to get to know as the ultimate expression of, of God's self-communication. And also, it's through Christ, the revelation is perfected. You know, certainly there's a scriptural heritage that precedes Christ. There's a tradition that precedes Christ, but that in Christ, that revelation is perfected and fulfilled. Next, Christ makes himself present and manifests God. And this is a crucial point. Jesus is not just revealed, but the revealer. He manifests and he communicates the divine. So that's why Christ is so essential, is that he's not just another prophet. He's the essence of who God is. And that's especially, the, the document goes on in paragraph 4 to state, uh, evident through his death and resurrection and the sending of the Spirit. Now here in paragraph 5, there's a delineation of the Catholic understanding of grace and how that relates to the life of faith. Because of course, if I'm going to truly encounter the other, I have to have some willingness, openness to encounter them. I can tell you my story, but if you're not open to hearing it and somehow being affected by it, then do you really know me? Can you really know my innermost being if you're not listening? Or if you turn all my words towards a negative or, or pessimistic tone? So this is the idea here, is how do we come to, into relationship with God? It requires not just to hear, but to receive. And uh, we call that faith. And here in paragraph 5, the discussion focuses upon the nature of faith and its relationship to grace. And the first point made here is that Faith is the person committing his or her, quote, whole self freely to God, offering the full submission of the intellect and the will to God who reveals and freely assenting to the truth revealed by God. So there's a uh, offering and assenting of the intellect and the will uh, to God. So a willingness to engage in relationship with God. So the first thing that paragraph five is trying to establish is that there has to be a free assent of the individual. So the nature of faith contains within it uh, human freedom. At the same time, it says this faith flows from the, quote, the grace of God and the interior help of the Holy Spirit, which must proceed and assist, moving the heart and turning it to God, opening the eyes of the mind and giving joy and ease to everyone and assenting to the truth and believing it. To bring about an ever deeper understanding of revelation, the same Holy Spirit constantly brings faith to completion by his gifts. So there's an element of faith that doesn't depend upon our choice, but comes from God. In fact, that must be prior to and continue within our act of faith. What we have here is the articulation of the relationship between faith and grace, which tries to respect human freedom, yet also seeing that grace is a divine gift. The document does not try to tease out how that relationship happens, and this is a crucial element within theology. You'll certainly deal with this at later points within your theological studies. The crucial question, the nature of faith and grace. One of the points being made here is that this revealing process is ongoing through the work of the Holy Spirit. So there is a place in which the Spirit uh, continues this work. It's not just the work of Christ didn't just happen, and the work of faith didn't just happen through the revelation of Christ, but it's an ongoing action of God. Moving on to paragraph 6, it talks about how, quote, through divine revelation, God chose to show forth 
and communicates himself and the eternal decisions of his will regarding the salvation of men. So here we're going back to this idea of self-communication and its connection to salvation. And notice this focus upon God's will, not so much on his intellect. That's his volition, his desire. So his desire is salvation of all people. And that's why he communicates himself to us. That's the only reason. He doesn't really want us to know him just to know him. There's a purpose to his self-revelation, his self-communication. It's for our salvation. And again, this is a very crucial point within this document, is that what God reveals is for the purpose of salvation, so that we can be sharers in his divine nature, this divinization of who we are. Paragraph 6 also makes the comment that Revelation make God, makes God's religious truth known, quote, with ease, with solid certitude, and with no trace of error. Okay, so the key here is that uh, the revelation makes the encounter or communication with God more straightforward and direct. Uh, we can, as we will see in Lumen Gentian, we can get to know God through other means, but it's not as easy to get to know God through those other means. It's not as solid uh, in terms of knowing for sure we've understood the evidence that we can see through nature or reason or history. Uh, about the nature of God, and we, it can be encrusted with error. So this is the point, that through scripture and tradition, we get a, if you will, more straightforward and direct understanding of the nature of God, even though that is available through other means. That's why Revelation has a purpose to it. So, here's my sort of summary of the key takeaways from these first six paragraphs. First, Revelation is God's self-communication. Second, the purpose of God's self-communication, that's Revelation, is human salvation. Three, God's ultimate self-communication is through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Four, Jesus reveals the innermost being of God by manifesting and communicating the divine. Very key point. Five, revelation and hence salvation, since that's the point of revelation, of self-communication is ultimately for salvation of the human person, is an encounter or an engagement with the divine or with God. So, that's really important. Revelation is framed within this encounter concept. Six, the divine encounter leads to humans sharing in the divine nature. Uh, that somehow that, that self-communication, we become connected. Seven, Revelation is fundamentally personal and relational, not doctrinal or dogmatic or moral. Not that those aren't important, but it's starting with the, the presupposition that uh, Revelation is encountered on a personal or relational nature. I, I actually like the relational concept most, because I think that's what the Council Fathers are getting at. And then eight, God also reveals or self-communicates his divine nature in creation, history, and reason. And then nine, proper response to revelation is faith, which is both divine gift and human act. All right, so if I were to summarize those nine points, I would use a quote from Pope Benedict from De Caritas S, his first encyclical on the, the love of God. And he says, quote, being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea. So again, it's not moral, it's not dogmatic or doctrinal, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction, unquote. I think that quote in many ways captures the essence of the first six paragraphs of Dei Verb. That is what it's trying to get at. That ultimately revelations about an encounter with an event, a person, and that gives life a new understanding, a new meaning, a new purpose, a new end, salvation, which is just another way of saying sharing his divine nature, which is a marvelous and surprising gift.